All right, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, information on spatial science. And I don't think many of you will know what it's all about, but um, does anyone know what spatial science is about just in the crowd? Two, two people doing the minor. So currently the, the course is offered within the BSc program, but um, our main intake is during our, um, sure, is, is through our master's program where we get about um, probably 50 to 60 students a year um, coming into, into the course. And so spatial science is essentially um, to do with disciplines focused on measuring and recording information that's sort of one side of it so people running around with little gps handheld gps's putting location information and putting that all in a, into databases so it's a it's a really multidisciplinary um, um, sort of discipline in terms of we we do a lot of statistical analysis on the data we do a lot of querying of the data to find out um, particular information within that data and we're usually concerned with mapping um, parts of the earth. So that's what spatial science is about. Some of the, the disciplines that we deal with are geographic information systems which are basically a computer system that allows us to uh, interrogate data etc and store data and manipulate the data. Global positioning systems and, and navigation systems which allow us to give us location to um, those things that we're trying to map or the attributes we're trying to map. And all sorts of cool stuff like laser scanning, creating 3D models, um, remote sensing, so using satellite data, and more specifically recently using um, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, you'll see a fair bit of that in the media. That's sort of my current um, research interest. And then things like cartography, where we actually use specific ways of presenting data to try and communicate that information a little bit better. So rather than get too into the subject material, I just thought I'd briefly go over some, some of the places where spatial information is being used, just so you can get a bit of an idea. And, and typically, a lot of people don't realise it, but it, it's, it's, it's very pervasive through almost every government department in terms of we've got local councils using it to manage all their assets. We've got services like electricity and water. So all of that information about where your house is, what your meter number is, when the person goes out to read that meter, that's all linked back through a geographic information system. And so those companies, obviously for billing, can use, utilise those systems, but they can also do a lot of queries on terms of, all right, is this suburb using more power than this suburb? Is this suburb got more solar infrastructure placed into it than this suburb? And so all of that information, provided it's got a location, can be analysed and looked at. And, and um, all sorts of other areas. Defence, obviously, would be a, a high user of of GIS. I went over, um, one of our students a few years ago invited me, he was a, a defence reservist and invited me over to Solomon Islands when they were, when they were over there and um, to show me their GIS stuff and that was quite a, quite a cool trip. I got to fly in the Prime Minister's plane because they couldn't, um, they couldn't get another plane to go so it was quite exciting. Uh, obviously consultants like environmental consultants um, use particularly GIS and all sorts of other industries which are concerned with improving efficiency. So logistics, trucking, um, all those sorts of things. You're, obviously you guys are, are of, of an age where you, you've you had your TomToms or your Google Maps or your, all the rest of the stuff that comes up um, quite um, frequently in your lives. You know, whenever you visit a Facebook website and it wants you to get to somewhere, it up comes a map, you click on it and away you go. So. All of that sort of stuff is, is to do with um, spatial science. I just thought I'd put a couple of um, sort of applications of where it's being used. So this is some data from Port Hedland in Western Australia where the, the, there was an environmental study done on the dust coming off the mine ore and what impact it was having on the native mangroves. And so what they've done here is they've flown over with um, uh, several million dollar what's called a hyperspectral camera so when we look at things we see our red green and blue that what makes our colour perception this camera can see 2500 colours not within the visible spectrum but out in the spectrums that we can't actually see the near infrared the short wave infrared etc and what what that produces is is this little curve on the front here according to the type of material that it's gone across and so this is a typical vegetation curve the other um, 
I might have not copied this properly because the other, oh, there we go. And so you can see that the leaves in the mangroves, so the green line there showing uh, a healthy plant that doesn't have this iron ore dust on it. And you can see the effect on that same plant once the iron ore dust is covering the surface of the plant. And so by knowing that information, then we can interrogate the actual underlying hyperspectral imagery, look at the specific wavelengths that we're interested in, and we can produce a nice coloured map there where you can see the pinks and violet colours there are showing where there's more iron oxide on the plants. And obviously from an environmental perspective, you can go out then and say, all right, how are we going to address that? So that's sort of one example. I was just going to run through a few ex other examples. Again, similar types of imagery here from a, a mining exploration perspective. Um, and what I'm trying to do is show you that it's not specific to one area, that this sort of information and technology is used quite broadly across a number of areas. And again, this is sort of uh, almost a chemical analysis using imagery, uh, spe using the spectrometry coming from that imagery to identify different mineralogy on the surface in the ground. So what they can, this is a massive sulphide um, deposit, uh, Captain's Flat, I think up New South Wales up near Bathurst, um, past Bathurst. Um, but looking for basically copper mineralisation uh, that's expressing itself on the surface. Likewise, if you look at this other picture here, it's also showing some drainage uh, dumps where there's, where there's pollution going into river systems and what have you. So again, you can come at this from both angles where you can be working for a mining company looking for potential exploration, uh, potential mineralisation so that you can obviously go and exploit that, make, get copper iron, whatever other materials you want. Or you can come at it from the environmental side where you're looking at pollution and ways to control that pollution, etc. And obviously, um, this is sort of my, more my area where we work in, I, work, I sit in the School of, of Ag and, and Wine Sciences and uh, my area is more focused on precision agriculture. So using the same sorts of technology, but to look at um, how plants are being stressed, how can we make, uh, how can we get more productivity out of a particular cropping system. So I work with some of the agronomists and uh, looking at things like nit nitrogen uptake in, in things like rice to see whether you know, is, is the timing, critical timing of when you apply nitrogen to these plants useful for increasing the production of the, of the plants, etc. Also looking at things like stress and all the rest of it to, to, um, to move forward. This is the sequence of subjects. Um, so you can do a spatial science minor um, and those, that's sort of grouping. What, the reason we put that grouping in there is it just, it gives you the basic applied skills to be able to utilise the computer system so that if you were to get yourself into an organisation that had these sorts of um, systems in them, and as I said, they're quite per per pervasive from New South Wales land to almost every government council, um, local government, federal government agency, environmental agencies, consultancies, all have a geographic information system where they're managing their data. You can imagine whenever you're in a project or whether, whenever you want to analyse data spatially. So if you're a chemist out collecting a lot of, lot of samples and you're looking at the trends in those samples, you might also see that there's some unique samples in an area. You might want to see whether there's any spatial association with those particular samples. Are they just randomly scattered through your, your sampling area or are they located in a specific area that coincides with, you know, some sort of pollution, rock mineralisation, I don't know, something along those lines. So what we've done with the spatial miner is we've given you an introduction to um, basic uh, remote sensing in terms of satellite imagery, what is it, how does it work, what are we measuring, what are typical patterns that we might see in those imagery. We've given you um, two GIS subjects, so an introductory GIS subject that just introduces you to the concepts, a little bit of the theory behind GIS and just gets you touching the software and saying, all right, well now I know what this software looks like and I can see how I can use it, a couple of basic examples within that. And then a, um, a more advanced GIS application subject which starts to make you use the software and answer problems and questions and query particular thing. If you thought, hey, this stuff's cool, I want to do a little bit more of that, We've, you continue on and you do the major, which takes you to the next level, all right? We, rather than just knowing about what this satellite stuff and what this, um, this imagery can do, let's actually start to learn how we can analyse that imagery. So we take you through 
through that. We use uh, commercial grade software um, that's currently used in almost all the government agencies out there so that when you finish these subjects you're current with the types of software that they're using and um, we take you through also a little bit of modelling. I guess I'll just finish up my sort of research area at CSU is, is focused on using unmanned aerial vehicles. So drones flying around and I've got quite a few good toys. I've got a three metre jet turbine helicopter that um, I can't fly <laughs> if uh, the Civil Aviation Authority is watching me on this camera. <laughs> I have a special person that comes in and flies it for me, it's all legal. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I have a few other, you know, I've got a three metre fixed wing um, plane and um, so nice toys for boys and girls um, and also what they call multi-copters so I've got octocopters and quadcopters that we fly around with and we've got quite expensive cameras there the camera system I've got one of those hyperspectral cameras that I was showing you the imagery on at the start there that's cost me about a hundred thousand bucks and that goes on on the helicopter and I pray every time the helicopter goes up that it's not going to that it's going to come down in an orderly fashion, not um, out of control and crashing to the ground. Um, yeah, and we've also got some multi-spec, so just less bands in those sorts of cameras, so specialised cameras. But th this area is really a, a booming area. So much of the world, particularly around the internet, wants that interactivity, and so that interactivity is driving different cameras. Now, you know, in the past you were happy with a photo of a of a building. Now you want to see that building reconstructed in 3D. And over the last year or two, we don't want to just see that building reconstructed in 3D. I want to walk in that building. I want to be able to see what's going on. I want to see you know, where the labs are. How big's that bench? Am I going to be able to get through that space? And so a lot of that stuff's developing. People are coming in with, rather than having a static camera like we've got at the, at the back here, they're modelling the whole entire room and putting that back into a database and so that you can do virtual walkthroughs and all that sort of stuff. So, we don't cover a lot of that in the course. We've sort of touched on a few of those things because it's pretty high level. But most of the software that we've got is capable of doing that. So if, once you've sort of got through the basics, you certainly can then start getting into some more of that complex stuff. And if, if you're interested in doing PhDs and all that sort of stuff, which is so far away, you, know, you can get into, into that. But any questions, I sit over in ag and wine, come, come say hi. Enjoy Joel at the Vic if that's where you're ending up. <laughs> <laughs> Two more days and the kidneys and bladder and all the rest of it will be on the mend, <laughs> maybe. Alright, thank you. Thank you.